Welcome to this week's sermon from Heights Worship Center. We believe God has something for you today. We hope this message encourages and inspires you. Look at y'all. Got, I left you. Y'all got fancy. What is this? We got a... Look at this. We got a screen in the back for the lyrics. So, see, y'all don't have to memorize no more words. See? We got an LED screen. And then we got all this space. You know I like to walk. So... I'm so glad to be back in the house. It's such a good thing um, to return home. It is, it's like, oh my, it's like when um, Paul said, I said, send for Timothy, for he's profitable for me now. Um, my hope is that I've gone and I've come back and like you see the evidence of God on my life. You've seen the growth in me. You've seen the, um, the tra- upward trajectory. I hope it's upward trajectory like you see. Um, but I'm so glad to be home. Um, I'm so glad to be in the house. It's, it's, there's comfort here. God is moving here. My goodness, this presence of God that radiates from this place is unlike any other. I, I, it exudes the vision of God, the heartbeat of God. And I just believe that as we were singing that song, shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus from the streets, I believe that God has strategically placed you in a position of apostolic influence and presence to be able to declare that song, not just in the city of Hacienda, but, in, but around the world, that he has, in, he has sustained you and placed you. There's not a lot of people he can... He can um, not only people he can trust with his heart, but that there is an apostolic anointing on you as you sing that song, as you declare the things of God, that he is not only he is not only propelling you, but he's strengthening you from the innermost being so that you can be able to withstand the call of God that is on this house. It has not changed. It has not changed the call of God on this house to be a beacon of light for those in the community, for that for it to be applied practically and spiritually has not changed. It is, you are the hands and the feet of Jesus. <laughs> so I just declare, I, you, guys, you guys were just seeing that. And I just declare, as you sing that, there is, it, it, it goes out. Before, the Bible says he sent a word and he healed them. So you, every time you sing that song, you send a word out into our community that heals a broken heart, that mends families, that brings people closer. Every time that you enter the street, you bring with you an apostolic anointing to to build his kingdom. That's what the book of Acts is. The book of Acts is an apostolic history book of us defining the church. In the early days, it is it is there is apostolic movements and apostolic uh, uh, divine appointments of not just the disciples but of of Paul of everyone who was sent out from that ministry, and is a book of how we establish the apostolic presence of God in a city, in a town, in your home. That's what it's for. The apostolic anointing is not just to plant churches, but it is to plant, it is to get communities rooted in the things of God that you might be doers and teachers of the word. That's why in Hebrews chapter 6, it says that you should be teachers by now. That you should know how to teach the word because there is a calling and there is an apostolic appointment, divine appointment for you. That as you enter into situations, as you enter into places, that apostolic anointing will go into work. And you'll see the manifestations in your city, in your school. See, see we're kingdom people. So we're, we are the kingdom operates. So, where, so that means that when I walk into a room, when I walk into City Hall, see, that's why that message needed to go out for before you today, because you've aligned yourself with people who are here for an apostolic move of the Holy Ghost. See, I came home not just to a family who was continuing to worship and believe God. I came home to apostolic movers and shakers. I came back home to get back in, in alignment with you guys and back into the vision of God. That's what happened when I walked in I sensed it that this is a place where the apostolic move of God goes forth that's what it is and every time you walk on this campus declare that this is a place where God resides 
This is a place that shakes us and, sh- and molds us and shapes us. That's what, the, that's what Heights Worship Center is. It's an apostolic headquarter for the things of God. Angels come and exit. They, they ascend and descend from this very spot. They're here on assignment. They're here to capture your words and to begin to do. That's why you have to be speakers and hearers of the word of God. Because the only thing they move on is a word from the book. That's why you need the the devotional. That's why we follow it. It is not because we don't have an idea or we don't have a plan. It is because the word of God must be rooted in you. It must be rooted in you. It must gird you because the calling is that of great importance. Amen. So Father God, we just thank you. We magnify and we worship you today. We exalt your name in this place, God, that you would be high and lifted up, Father. That you would be high and lifted. We magnify you, God. We join in with heaven this morning and we align ourselves, Father God. We say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That from this very spot, Father God, we will change the world. In the name of Jesus, and we thank you, God. I declare that as the, as the service continues, as worship continues through the word, Father God, that you would minister to the people of God. You would touch hearts and open minds and eyes to hear what you have need of. Father God, I declare and decree that everything that attaches to them, Father God, that you're working it out as they sit in here, as they hear the word of God. You have sent angelic assignment on their behalf to work out everything that pertains to them. We thank you, God, that you, you, we seek after you. And because we seek your face, God, everything that pertains to us is put in order. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, everything that's attached to the house, Father God, let it be put in order. Everything that's attached from this house, let it be put in order. We come against any weapon that might form against it. We say that it shall and will not prosper. We declare, Father God, everything is being set in order. There's divine connections and appointments. You're moving heaven and earth on their behalf. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. So we magnify you and we exalt your name today, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. We worship you, God. In the name of Jesus. So I want to come and talk to you guys today about um, about eternity. And that sounds like a that sounds like a really big word, and it is. It's filled with so much anticipation and so much hope. And what I love is that we are longing for eternity. It is within us. And I'm going to take you over to John chapter 14. And we're, we're going to go from verse 1 through verse 3. John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Let me get there, Jesus. All right. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. So, um, chapter 14, it says this. First, starting at verse 1, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. 
And so we're talking about eternity, and we have to understand that eternity was placed in us by God. For your longing for eternity, your longing for the things of God is a Holy Spirit desire he placed in you. In the book of Ecclesiastes, in, in, in verse 3, in chapter 3, verse 11, this is what it says. It says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. So we are wired for eternity. We long for a place that we know is there mentally, but we have not seen it physically. And what I love about God is that on this side of earth, we have opportunities to attend to experience eternity now. Sometimes you experience it in a corporate worship setting where the glory of God comes in. That's a, that's a glimpse of eternity. When you feel the presence of God rushing the manifested presence of the glory of God, that is a glimpse of eternity. When you're in your prayer closet and you're praying and the Holy Spirit comes in like a flood, that is a glimpse of eternity. Every time we have a situation or we step into a situation that is God-ordained and God-orchestrated and no one could do it but God, a glimpse of eternity. He's in, I don't want to say he's in the simple things because that decomplexes it. He is, in, he is in all things and he's making all things work together for your good. So every time you step into, I want to call it a Kairos moment, a moment ordained by God, you have entered into a small glimpse on this side of heaven of what is for you eternally. What is for you infinitely after you leave this body, that's all, God's so good. After you leave this body, there's a glimpse, there is eternity for you. That you do not, that your life is not unto death, but it's a continuation of life. I just detach from this mortal body and continue on to my spiritual body and resume with God. It is like Enoch, he was and then was no more. <laughs> My parents go to a, a church out in the southern Orange County, and the pastor made this statement about death, and I loved it. I was like, dang, that's good. He said, death is a closet where you change and enter into what God has predestined for you. It is a closet where you change out of this fleshly body that was not, that was no, after the fall, was no longer made and contained to be in the glory of God I go we go into death but we don't stay there we walk out of that closet into eternity with Christ and it's so <clears throat> thank you it's, I'm sorry I, I got sick the devil is alive I had got sick two weeks before and my throat swelled up and my throat is still coming back I don't know why it's just ling lingering I'm gonna put it here I won't kick it I promise um but that's what death is. It, is. it is a closet where we change. Oh, death, where is your sting? It is not meant for us to stay and be absent from God, but our eternity is to be present with the Lord. Amen? Amen? And so we long for eternity. We long to be with God. And because he's so gracious, he gives us those moments, those moments where we get to step in with him and we get a glimpse into his, his, heavenly, his heavenly cosmos office, as I like to call it, because I am dramatic. That's what I do. Um, I, just, I just imagine God has, a, has an office in heaven. He does work. He needs a space, right? You know what I'm saying? But he has a really cool office because it's in heaven. It's in the cosmos. Hmm? Stars are all around. It's space. There's stars. Stars are all around. And it's glass. And, and in, in, in his office, he, be, he lays out. But he did. But see, I'm, 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 back in, I'm, I'm a little confused in my theology because he already did this from the, the foundation of the world. So this is a, a previous flashback to our, what he already do before you were formed in your mother's womb. So he's in the heavenly office in his glass cosmo and he's with the Trinity. The Trinity is present and he's working out your life and he's orchestrating it and he's designing eternity for you and he's setting in motion everything that you would do and everything that you will do in this in this destination that, he's, that, he, that he sits and he thinks about the things of God as it pertains to you. 
and he watches the story unfold that he's already orchestrated before time began. And he just sits back and watches time because he is not in time. He's eternal, so he's outside of time. He created time for us that, why, that we might know him. See, the seasons and the changing of seasons is for us. It is not for God. Because God has already orchestrated everything. that he, That's a word for somebody. God has already orchestrated everything that pertains to your life before you even got here. You're just stepping into provision every time you continue to walk. You're just stepping into provision that has already been planned for you. So everything that you need, everything that you want, everything that you desire is already out there. The, I believe the ram in the bush was already there before he made it up the mountain. It wasn't, it wasn't an idea that he had at the end of the moment, like, oh my gosh, he's really going to do it. Put a ram. No. He put a ram at the beginning of time. He put a ram in the bush so that when Abraham got up the mountain, because he knew he would, he said, no, 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 no. I knew, I knew, I knew you were going to be able to do it. There's a ram in, in the thicket. Sacrifice that. Leave, leave him. There was already a ram. I have to believe it. I have to. I have to stand on that notion that everything that pertains to me is already is already set up and established for me. So I just need the wisdom and the strategy of God to get to the provision that he has assigned for me. And so when we talk about eternity, we are talking about that. That where the place at which where God does, resides outside of time and outside of pain and sorrow where his fullness sits Amen. that is encamped around angels that sing holy and glory unto the lamb who was slain where they, where they ask in heaven who was worthy to open the scroll we can find no one on heaven or earth who was worthy to open the scroll oh we know who's worthy to open the scroll the lamb that which was slain see See, the, 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 the powerful thing about the Lamb of God, I'm going to get back to what we're talking about, I promise. The powerful thing about the Lamb and the sacrifice of God is everything God had to orchestrate in order to get the Lamb there. Everything he planned, up all the way up to the day in which he was gathered in the garden. Because what we don't realize is the day that he was gathered is the same day they brought the lambs for the slaying of Passover. So we brought a lamb, God brought a lamb. See, see, we think that, that sometimes we, we get a little confused because we think that God operates outside of the order that he's already established. No, he used the same law he gave to the children of Israel to put, to put redemption back in the earth. The same law. They brought a lamb, he brought a lamb. It had to be spot, they had to have a spotless lamb, he needed a spotless lamb. He needed someone who was worthy of the, of the offering that he was getting ready to present. And then he went us most to put a high priest there and to watch over the sacrifice. And he placed him there and he gave his sacrifice. He gave his offering because you think you lay your life down on the altar. He laid his son down on the altar. That's why what Christine said was so powerful because sometimes we are enamored with God. We want you. We want to be near you. God said, I ordained it and orchestrated it first so that when you got here, I was already here and waiting. So this, this is eternity. It is, it is more complex than the, the goosebumps. And the whoo, that was good. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes we walk out drunk from the spirit. It's more than that. It's more than that. And so when we think about eternity, we have to know that it is a God-given desire. And that his return as king, his return as king is imminent. That word imminent is so big, but once again, once again, you know, sometimes we, we, we downgrade things about God when we should really just elevate people into the better understanding of who he is. You know what I'm saying? So imminent is we don't have to downgrade it. We have to know that the, the 
pregnancy of that word is important, that his coming is, is imminent. It is coming. It is happening. It is in full motion. Though we may not know the season, nor, no, we may not know the hour, we are told to know the season. We don't know the hour in which he will come. And so we sit in this pregnant place of, of, of time for when he will return. And so the, the object of or the title of our devotion this week is to finish strong. But we have to understand that we're not finishing strong for, for ourselves or for you to be a better version of yourself. We are finishing strong because his return is imminent. So how do we how do we do this? How do we how do we as believers of God sitting in this eternal like tension, I like to call it, let's call it eternal tension, where we're sitting and we're waiting for him to return. What do we do? The, uh, there's a phrase that says idle hands is for the devil's play. I think it, that's not the correct term because we didn't give no place to the devil. But I think idle hands do lead to a unreadiness for the things of God. So as we finish strong, what we have to do is if you ask any athlete, the closer you get to a game, the closer to you get to like a big game, like it's down the line. I, ain't never, I played some sports, but I ain't really never played no sports. I don't know why he gave me a sports analogy. <laughs> well, here we go. I played some sports, but I was like, we're not even going to go there. So, <laughs> so. It is like an athlete that prepares for the Olympics, for their, ra for their race specifically. Let's, let's bring it in, not just the Olympics overall, but their race specifically, that they begin to kind of zero in. They put their headphones in or whatever they have, and they focus in. They get, they get a distinct focus about the task at hand. So in order for us to finish strong, we have to begin to get a fixed focus on Jesus. That's the goal, that we get a fixed focus. And in this day and age, clatter and distraction is just getting louder and louder. It's just getting, it's just getting worse. The, the more we live, the longer we continue to live, it will get worse. The, the level of distraction we have, my goodness, I'm going to be honest, I'm going to tell myself, I was trying to do some homework, yo, and every five minutes, my friend was like, Andrea, why are you on your phone? I'm not talking to nobody, really, honestly. I'm just on my phone. The level of distraction that is, that is in our pockets and, and on us and attached to us, it's crazy, and because distraction has increased complacency also has increased see when a when an athlete gets focused they eliminate distraction that's why they'll put like they'll get a, alone somewhere they'll put some music on because they're trying to get out the outside voices out and zero in on the task the task is winning for every athlete the task is winning it's not to get out here and try your best it's to win and so as believers, our task has to be focused. We have to get some focus about us, some tenacity about us to block out all the noise and zero in on the kingdom. That's what we have to do as we press forward, as we wait, as we sit in this eternal tension, as we wait for the imminent return of our king, we have to zero in. We need to. We have to eliminate distractions. We have to. I was telling, I was sitting and talking with a friend, and she was asking me my, my thought process on, on my thoughts on something. And I was talking to her about, about um, giving something up. I said, you know, I know when something's a stronghold in my life, when God asks me to give something up and I hesitate. And I, and I begin to um, compromise with God, like he's not God. <laughs> like, I can, like I can figure, like, okay, let's talk. How about we do two weeks 
get a reset and we come back. No, God said, no, I ask you to lay it down. Anything that I hesitate about, I hate, I lay it down faster. The quicker I lay it down, whoo, the moment, I, oh shoot, mm -mm, time to go. You gotta go, I deleted it so fast. If you wanted to know, it was Instagram. Deleted it so fast. My mom would say, oh, I sent you something on Instagram. I said, I'm fast in Instagram right now. I didn't say it. She goes, okay, I'll show you. It's like, ugh. The feet's the fast, but it's okay. <laughs> and so, <laughs> right? But the, um, we have to get rid of distractions. We have to, and if you are hesitating, if you, you know what I'm saying? Like God says, give up the, and you kind of buck, you know what I'm saying? Like he, like he gonna hit you or, you know, what I'm, you know how you flink. Okay, y some of y'all been in a fight. You know how you flink before they hit the punch? That's what I'm talking about. You kind of like, and, and you, ha you take a second guess about what the king of glory has asked you to lay down when he's given up your life. Lay it down faster. Drop it like it's like, not like it's hot. Drop it. <laughs> <laughs> Drop it like it's on fire. Okay, okay, that was even worse. But it's okay, you get the call. Everyone to the altar, please, that got the reference. We have to talk. Um, but no, we, we give it up. We, <laughs> you're playing your fastest showing. Okay, we give it up faster. Amen? Amen? So it is the goal, it is the goal that we emul we we get rid of distractions and we focus in. Because our focusing in and our eliminating of distractions signals that we have taken that verse that we all love in Matthew chapter six, verse 33. Matthew chapter six, verse 33, and it says this. It's, let me go to it. <laughs> it says, but seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. That's what we do when we focus in. And sometimes I think that in that verse, that we, um, we think of that verse as it pertains to like people in ministry or like a monk mentality or like we're gonna go into like, not, not to say the people who gave their life who are, who are mothers and sisters in the Catholic Church didn't do it for a very good reason, but that what we're gonna go into like this mode of isolation or like, that is only designed if I'm going to go into ministry. That I seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto me. Because there is a denial of self within that sentence that can scare. It's almost like the, the young, the rich young ruler. He said give up all his things. It is, it's that, it's that, that, that give and take moment in that scripture that we have when we read it. Where we're convicted like, oh, I'll seek first the kingdom. But what I want to tell you when... When we do this verse, it is not that we seek first the kingdom and then everything else in our life loses balance. It's that I seek first the kingdom and I am empowered to do everything else that is attached to me. It is, it is the practical application of John 15. I am the vine, I am the vine, you are the branches. It is, it is that I am, I abide in him and, and he abides in me. It is this understanding that my power, my excellence to do everything that is attached to me only comes when I seek first the kingdom and all these things are added unto me. And I do them, you're, you, and you make motherhood look easy. Why? Because you seek first the kingdom. You're good on your job. Why? Because you seek first the kingdom. It is not, we, we are taught today this, this self-empowerment situation, and that's not the case. We're, we're, we're not meant to do this in our own will, in our own, our own power, and our own strength. No, I get my strength and before God, and I do everything that is attached to me to do that day. I seek him first, his kingdom, his glory, his righteousness, his kindness, his love. I seek him first. He solidifies me in his word, and I go about to do that is what it, that which is attached to me. So we have to understand that when it comes to, and, I, and I, I say this to myself as I say it out loud, my vocation is not my call. My call is my call. My, my, my vocation is given to me to live out my call. 
I'm a mom. Why? Because building children for the kingdom of God is a call. I'm a nurse. Why? Because laying hands on the sick is what I was designed to do. See, if you, oh, Jesus, I declare this over my sister every time she walks in the hospital, that every time she walks in, the kingdom of glory walks in. So that hospital has to be emptied out. Any disease that would try to attach itself to her has to die. So your, your vocation is not your calling. You are called and you have a job. That's how it works. He is our source and he uses them to get resources to me. They are a, not in a negative connotation, but they are a pawn in his hand. You know why they pay you? Because Jesus told them to. You know why you're at that job? Because Jesus knew that you had light bills to pay so that you could study the word. That's why you're at the job. That's why you're there. He knew you were going to need to eat. So he made a way, a, div- a divine appointment. Though you just thought you submitted a job application, it was a divine appointment because he had prosperity and provision to get to you. So he gave you that career, those experiences to step into that job. So he, because he is not pouring money out the sky. He don't have... He don't have a machine up there where he looks like money. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He's not doing that. So he has to move. This, this, see, this is the glory of this is eternity. He has to move on the life of someone else to get that. The, the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the just. He has to move on their life, though they might, might not want it to, to bless you. This, this is a glimpse of eternity. It's, this is what he does. This is who he is. And so we have to understand that in order for us to balance within this tension of his imminent return, we have to fixate ourselves on Jesus. And as we fixate ourselves on Jesus, everything that pertains to me will get taken care of. And so we, we, have, we understand that. We get it. But Andrea, what are we? We're fixating on Jesus to do what? Oh my gosh, let me tell you something. We are fixated on Jesus to build his kingdom. We have a king to prepare for. He is coming. He will crack the eastern sky and ride in. And he is coming. So it is our job to get the world in order. See, when he went to the cross and he redeemed you, he blessed you, he put the blood of Jesus on you. Guess what? He gave you back Adam's job. The job that was stripped away from him in the garden, you got it back. You didn't know you signed up for that call, but that's what you got. You stepped into that. You stepped into that role. And so our job as people is to be like Ezekiel. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter chapter 3. We're going to go to Ezekiel chapter 3. I'm going to read it from the board because it's bigger than my font. So (laughs) now it came to pass. At the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them them warning from me that when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die and you give him no warning nor speak with, with warned the wicked from his wicked ways to save his life. That same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood required at your hands yet if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness nor from his wicked ways he shall die in his iniquity but you shall have delivered your soul the goal and the preparation for the kingdom and that is that he has set us as watchmen on the wall to warn the people of God of his imminent return that's the goal that we are set like Ezekiel at watchers like like um like Habakkuk, who waits to see what the Lord will say and deliver that same word to the people. That's what, that's what Habakkuk was. He was a watchman. He was a prophet, but he was a watchman as a prophet. And he waited. He perched. He said, I'm going to wait and see what the Lord will say. And he gave it to him. He said, write the vision and make it plain that though they may see it, may run with it. We are watchmen for the kingdom. And we're not watchmen as, as, as if the world is first. 
We're watchmen for our families. We sit on the wall and we watch because what good is it for you to win the world and, and lose your own soul or lose your own family? What good is it if we saved everybody else and your uncle does not come with us into eternity? What good is it if the neighbor next door doesn't know that there is an imminent return of, king, of God's kingdom? What good is it if they, if they perish, if they die? What good is it? If they, see, we don't like talking about the realities of not choosing God, but we have to talk about the reality of not choosing God. We have to address it. There is only one way into the kingdom of God. It is through Christ Jesus. The only other way, the only other option, because he's not sending people to hell, is a life separated from God. That's the only other option. We can't sugarcoat it. I can't tell you anything else. I don't have anything else to tell you. The only other option is separation from him. So we are set as watchmen because our family needs to be warned. We are set as watchmen because our friends need to be warned. We're set as watchmen because everybody who's attached to us needs to know that there is a king and he is returning and the other end is judgment and I don't want you to go into judgment so know your wicked ways. The other option is death and I don't, and, and I don't want you to go there. That's the only other option. And then it is, it is the, and from our families, it is the world around us. It is us standing on street corners like wisdom, yelling and declaring the things of the Lord. It is declaring them in every stadium, in every, in every, on every TV station. It is, it is declaring that he is coming. And Hebrews, it, the Bible says that with godly fear of the Lord, Noah prepared an ark so that his family would not perish. See, people think that he only, he built an ark one time. He built another ark that is soon, soon to be closing. And this time, it's not, he's not drowning the world with water. He's not drowning the world with water. This ark will close and will not open again. And so we have to understand that that is what we live in. In Matthew, in the book of Matthew, we see the Great Commission. And it's in Mark, not the book of Matthew, the book of Mark. It's in the book of Matthew too, but in the book of Mark. Mark chapter 16, he says, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then it goes on to say that, that the, the, these signs will follow you. These signs will follow those who believe. You'll cast out demons. You'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You'll baptize people in water and in fire. And he declares what you're going to do. And so I came to tell you that your job has not changed. The same, the same thing he told Peter at the shoreline. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Then feed my sheep. It's the same call you've been called to. The same reason Paul was knocked on the ground on the road to Damascus and was encountered Jesus is the same call you've been called to. The same reason Noah built an ark is the same reason you tell your friends and family about Jesus Christ. The job hasn't changed. He's not doing anything new in that regard he still needs you to be the hands and the feet of Jesus we have to understand that when he cracks the sky open and I go and you go that there will be people here who have not heard the preaching of the gospel who have, who have said no oh, my goodness that when we go there will be people left to, 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 to face what, it, what, it, what has been declared by scripture? My God, why would we let them be here without using every opportunity that we have? We're going to leave them? We have to understand that to, in order to finish strong, we are building his kingdom for his glory, for his purposes. And everything that's attached to you, don't worry, it's going to work out. But we have to zero in we have to finish strong. Paul says, run the race that was set before you, laying aside every sin and every weight that may ensnare you and press towards. He continues to say, he says, press towards the mark of the high calling. I do not, do not perceive that I have attained all that there is, but I press forward in the call of the high calling. He pressed 
towards the mark. He had a job. He didn't sit in prison and write the epistles so that we could, we could live a better life. No, he sat there and wrote the epistles so that he could connect with someone who had the same mission from God to preach to every known person in the world. To go everywhere the Holy Spirit goes with them. To not go any place the Holy Spirit tells him not to go to. He was writing to a people in a time that would grab the call of God and say, I won't stop until my community is saved. I won't stop till my neighborhood is saved. My whole block is saved. It's not outrageous. It's the call of God. And you have been empowered through the Holy Spirit, to do all of it, to, to, to attain all of it. It is only astronomical without God, with God. It is simple, and it is a plan that is, has wisdom attached to it. With God, it is easy. And so we sit in this place of eternal tension that he has not come yet, but he is coming. He has not come yet, but he is coming. The Bible says that he would come like a thief in the night, that he would come like lightning. That's what the Bible says, that he would come and scoop up the people. of. He's coming whether you like it or not. Wake up, you sleeping giants. He's coming whether you like it or not. And it is in it. You could think, oh, well, I have this plan tomorrow, so it's going to work out. I need you to know there ain't nothing left in this Bible to be accomplished for him to step out of, of eternity and into our and into our world there's nothing holding him back from cracking the eastern sky you know the only thing holding him back from cracking the eastern sky the only one that stretches out that stretches out the terry the people of god doing what they're called to do it's almost like god sits and says no they're winning one more show no they have one more crusade no she's talking to that friend no she's planted that seed just give him a little bit more time my people are at work so i'll wait jesus sit i need a couple more people into the kingdom of god we'll stay right there hold your horses and the chariots hold on they're almost here hold on their decision is almost here they made a decision they're gonna make it today because i placed them in a church with the speaker who knows the word so they're gonna receive it i know they are that's why he waits because he's a good father and he sits and he waits and he tarries just a little bit longer not because we're not doing what we're called to do because we but because we are but because we're taking the enemy's territory by storm with every foot tread that we walk on we're taking him by storm So as I, as I, as I close, I want, I want you, I want to explain something to you. I'm going to come down here. Sorry, camera people. I want to explain to you that if you are here, if you are here and you know that you do not have a relationship with a heavenly father, if you are here and you, come on, don't, the, 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 Plan to play games, and you know you have walked away from God. Discard your pride and every shame the devil would try to put on you. That this is the day the Lord has made, so we shall rejoice and be glad in it because this is the day of your reconciliation back into the Father. So if you're here today and you know that you have been have been strayed away from God, if you knew Him and you say I'm no longer in a relationship with Him, if you don't know Him and you want to be in a relationship with him and you want to sit in eternity's tension along with you if that's your choice if that's the choice you want to make today with every eye closed and every head bowed I want you to know that today is the day to make that decision we're not going to wait any longer I don't care if it's only one person I don't care if you know God and you're and you do mighty things for him but if you know that you have walked away from God and you want a chance to sit down in eternity with him I, can, I make you a clarion call like John the Baptist in the wilderness that there is one that is like no other that there is one 
who will wash away your sin. There is one who will wash away the shame. There is one who will bring you back into reconciliation with the Father that he has come to do just that, that he died on the cross just for you. If this is your reason with every head, every eye closed and every head bowed, if that is you, that we never leave this place without giving you an opportunity. If that is you, and with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want you to just shoot your hand up in the air. I want you to throw off every weight and every chain and every shackle that he has come to break today because he's in the room. If that's you, with every head bowed, with no one moving, no one walking around, because eternity is at stake. If that is you, just shoot your hand up in the air. If that's you. So, Father God, we just want to acknowledge those in the room who want a relationship with you. Who want to know you, God. And those who have walked away and called, become cold, calloused, and indifferent to your word and to your kingdom, God. I'm going to ask you to do something that's so bold. I'm going to ask you to do something that I know is, in, that I know is hard. But if that is you and you raise your hand, even if it is just you, would you make your way down to the altar? Because we don't want to leave this place without you knowing. We don't want to leave this place without you knowing. We're going to linger here for just a moment if that's okay. Because we want to give people enough time. Because tomorrow is not promised to no one. And we want to give people enough time. <laughs> so with every head bowed and every eye closed, we're just going to declare this together. Would you guys say this together with me? Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for the... the <laughs> we thank you for the sacrifice that you made on the cross to reconcile us back to God. We, we receive you. We ask that you come and live in our hearts. We thank you for the blood that washes as white as snow. That it is finished. It is done. And I enter into eternity with you. Right now. Today on this side of heaven. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening to our podcast. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Visit us in person or online at hwcim.org.